of the next speaker will um, be uh, Haim Benaroya. Um, and uh, uh, he has been, he's graduate of Cooper Union in New York and the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and has uh, loads of experience from uh, consulting engineering and uh, teaching and the study of structural dynamics. Published several books in um, engineering, vibration and uh, probabilistic models, as well as lunar habitats turning dust to gold and building habitats on the moon. And he was the editor of uh, Lunar Settlements in 2010, which I wrote chapter 27 for, which you probably have no re recollection of. But uh, uh, please uh, present uh, about recent concepts for lunar habitats. The floor is yours and the ether. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ben and Nicholas, uh, for organizing this. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I know many of the many of the other attendees and speakers. Let me share my screen. How is that? Is that good? Nope, we don't see it yet. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, you should just be able to hit the share screen button in the the bottom bar. It's Bright green. Yeah. yeah, I okay. Let me let me try that again. Uh, hold on a sec. Okay. Too many too many windows open. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> common problem. Okay. There we go. And that should be the full screen now. Is that? Is that good? Looks good. Okay. So it's again, it's great to be here. And uh, uh, my goal with this presentation is to just give an overview of habitat concepts and the environment that uh, engineers in the future will have to deal with when building habitats on the surface, beneath the surface, uh, and to try to just uh, give an overview to, to all of you. So I always like to start with these sketches by Leonardo da Vinci from uh, 1500. Um, over 500 years ago, uh, these, are, these are some of the earliest sketches of the lunar surface. You can see the dimensions. One, the one on the left is only two centimeters, the one on the right is 18 centimeters. Uh, and uh, of course, they didn't know what those dark spots were, but uh, uh, I guess that was probably, probably the initiation of documenting the lunar surface. Galileo didn't uh, invent it, uh, I mean, he didn't invent the telescope, but the telescope was invented in 1609, and Galileo uh, was the first one to use a telescope to start uh, looking at the moon. Uh, just a little bit of rocketry background. Uh, we have here just four people who, of many who uh, were pioneers in the rocketry era, from uh, Robert Goddard to Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, uh, Robert Esnol Peltier, uh, and Herman Oberth all of whom um, jump-started uh, our, uh, our reach for the stars. And this uh, image uh, from July 21, 1969, those of us who are uh, old enough uh, will remember that day and remember where we were when, uh, when uh, these three men landed on the moon. And uh, very quickly afterwards, President Nixon at the time uh, spoke with them, uh, basically looking at a black and white image uh, on his TV. And there's Neil Armstrong, uh, who was uh, really a, a very uh, modest person, given the magnitude of his achievement. Uh, he was as modest as his achievement was great. And here's a picture of Harrison Schmidt, who was a, a planetary geologist um, on the last Apollo, which was the longest duration Apollo on the lunar surface, uh, looking for rocks to bring back. And I, I believe that was the Apollo that brought back the bulk of the, uh, the uh, rocks uh, back to the Earth. And it's always good to remember the comparative sizes as we speak about the Moon, Mars, and the Earth. Uh, basically, uh, these are all radii, but basically uh, the ratio of the radii of Moon, Mars, and Earth is roughly one to two to four. And, um, and uh, I always, like many people, always imagine the Moon to be much bigger than it really is in comparison to, to the Earth. So this is a sort of a scale scale comparison that 
reminds us how small the, the moon really is. So getting to the uh, environment, there are a number of key issues that any engineer uh, or scientist dealing with human factors will have to uh, tackle uh, when considering placing humans on the moon for any duration. Uh, the first one of these is the fact that the moon has a 1.6 g, Earth g gravitational acceleration. I'll talk more about that just on the next slide regarding uh, human physiology. Any habitat on the moon uh, will have to be internally pressurized so humans can uh, walk around without spacesuits. Um, and people have been talking about anywhere from 5 to 15 psi, with 10 psi being a reasonable starting point. We have to protect humans from radiation and micrometeorites. We have to insulate the habitat in interior from temp uh, temperature differentials of about 250 degrees Celsius. Uh, and people are talking about about two to three meters of regolith to cover a surface structure that will help alleviate many of these environmental dangers, uh, although not all of the same magnitude. Uh, I put at the bottom separately, regolith handling dangers. So regolith, uh, as the previous speaker noted, is very valuable for all the, all the materials uh, we have to extract and use, and we really will depend on the regolith, so we don't have to bring everything from the earth. But the other side of the point of regolith is it, it's very damaging and dangerous. So it's damaging to machines, damaging to uh, airlocks, gears. Uh, we know from the Apollo experience that the regolith really did a lot of uh, hindrance to operations on the lunar surface. Uh, we also learned later that the regolith uh, made its way into the astronaut's lungs, made its way into the capsule. And so regolith handling becomes a prime concern. Um, it's electrostatic or the low gravity on the lunar surface. Uh, any disturbance tends to float it around. And if we're going to have landings and takeoffs from the lunar surface, we have to make sure that those, uh, those engines don't uh, put a lot of regolith uh, not only uh, into the local area, but even into orbit around, around the moon, creating real dangers. So regolith is always an issue. Uh, as far as the low gravity environment, we've learned a lot from uh, the space station experience, uh, but we've also learned some from uh, what we know uh, happened on the moon. Um, and I have a whole list of things here that happen when you are in low gravity, everything from cardiovascular deconditioning, the shifting of body fluids to the upper body, uh, loss of vestibular sense, loss of blood volume, cataracts, atrophy of muscle, uh, long-term uh, cancer, bone demineralization at the amazing rate of 1.5% per month, and pharm pharmacological issues, meaning that uh, the medicines that we create here on Earth assume that we have a fully circul uh, circulating uh, blood flow in our bodies uh, in low gravity because of the low gravity, we don't have that. And so the way that we deal with uh, um, medicines that we take to our bloodstream uh, will have to be uh, thought about. In addition to that, we have psycho psychological issues, and these come from uh, isolation and confinement, um, which result in lower cognitive brain function, depression, compulsive behavior. Um, the stresses come from being in a dangerous location from which extraction is almost uh, uh, is, is very limited, if not impossible, extremely heavy workload, uh, and enforced togetherness, close quarters with people uh, uh, over long periods of time. Uh, we, we know that this leads to introversion and, and impairs the immune system. So these are things that we all have to be uh, concerned about. Uh, on the moon, we have uh, a lot of um, important elements that we uh, hope to be able to mine and extract and utilize everything from oxygen. In, in, so these are average, really. So this, the, there are variations, obviously. 42% uh, oxygen, we have silicon, magnesium, calcium, iron, aluminum, and other elements. Um, I would say regarding magnesium, uh, we've done some studies that uh, even though on Earth we can't use magnesium as a structural material, uh, on the moon it's possible taking certain precautions uh, about magnesium is to, uh, to use it as a a structural material given the 1,6 G environment. Uh, and so uh, the, the, uh, the weight of something is 1,6 less and, and becomes very useful uh, as a structural material, as well as the other materials that you see there among many others. So going to the moon, 
Uh, one of the things that we want to do on the moon, as uh, a number of us have spoken today, uh, is to look around for elements that we can use for our operations. Uh, uh, so this uh, concept from NASA called PAYBOT, which stands for Habitable Robot. Uh, you see these robots, modular robots, uh, that uh, are looking around for uh, elements. You can see the, the, the person in the little window on the left. Uh, you can see it in the valley below, you can see uh, six or seven of these hay bots docked together to create a temporary um, habitat for the, the people that are exploring. Astronomy is another uh, reason why we're talking about going back to the moon, astronomy, but science in general. So this earlier image shows uh, large uh, collector dishes uh, uh, in, in a crater and telescopes. Uh, and uh, a pretty large astronomical facility, um, providing a seismically stable and shielded environment from Earth's electronic noise. So this would be on the lunar far side. Um, since this image, there's been a lot of advances in more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, astronomical equipment, many of which are not as large as this and can be actually much smaller and more easy to deploy. So as far as habitats, people have been thinking about habitats for a long time. I thought this image is actually a, a nice one. It shows a, a concept from a book by Arthur C. Clarke, a, a science book, not a science fiction book. Uh, and in this sketch, we see what looks like an egg-shaped structure on stilts, like, uh, sitting on the lunar surface. Uh, what you'll see in a lot of these early concepts is that uh, if they are sort of pressure vessel kinds of structures, they're going to be uh, egg shape, cylindrical shape, uh, because those are the structurally strongest shapes uh, from the point of view of, of internally pressurizing them. Uh, so we see in this, uh, uh, I'm not sure where this uh, uh, scene is meant to be, but uh, basically we have a pretty large structure already on the surface and astronauts walking around trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, subsequent to that, during the Apollo era, uh, everybody assumed that once we landed on the moon, that we would also stay and continue to develop it. So we see again uh, structural cylinders, pressure vessels uh, in various configurations, uh, partially buried, uh, no regolith on top, but I think these were more uh, initial concepts. Uh, but um, probably the first lunar base will actually look a lot like this. Uh, if we assume that pressure vessels are going to be the ones that actually uh, uh, sit on the lunar surface. So here's a concept, uh, again, during that era uh, by Boeing, uh, showing a relatively large structural uh, cylindrical structure. Uh, we see this one, I believe, was for uh, meant to be for six people for six months at a time, and, and then they would rotate out. Uh, on the top right there, you see uh, essentially a vacuum uh, truck uh, pumping regolith to, to these to the roof of this uh, habitat. Now you can't see it here very, uh, because it doesn't show, but uh, the the walls are are double concentric walls with a gap in between. And when the regolith is placed on the roof, uh, we have the regolith working its way in between those two concentric structural cylinders, thus providing shielding not only from above but also from the sides, since obviously radiation comes from uh, all directions. And we see then um, a more elaborate system there on the left, taking the initial cylinders and placing a lot of them within a structural framework, uh, tying them together, and then covering the whole thing into uh, a larger facility. So these are prefabricated modules like the ones we, we have on the space station, more or less. Uh, that for a while, there was a talk about using um, some rocket bodies that we launch into space and reconfiguring them in space and then uh, sending them over to the moon. Uh, and landing them, uh, although that seems to be not uh, as economical as some might think. So another reason to go to the moon, uh, tourism. Tourism uh, will probably be a big thing eventually. Uh, this is a concept from um, about 20 years ago by Hilton, uh, who hired a, a famous uh, architect from England to conceive of what a lunar hotel might look like. And so this is a, a lunar Hilton. Um, you see that huge meteorite on the top right. I just point out that uh, for me, being on the moon would be exciting enough without being in the path of a huge meteorite, but everybody has their limits. And here is a, a lunar Marriott. 
So the Hilton was a lot of glass and things that look more like Earth structures, which are really infeasible for the lunar surface. This Marriott, you know, looks more like a very uh, um, built up structure, um, able to, to handle uh, a lot of internal pressurization, as well as uh, perhaps damage from the exterior and you see a couple of astronauts flying around, enjoying their, their stay on the moon. And of course, just like those uh, Hagbots uh, exploring, um, we expect that uh, eventually uh, people who are uh, on the moon will want to travel around the moon. And these are uh, concepts for pressurized rovers. But again, a few of them can uh, latch together, creating a, a larger space and more of a habitat environment. Uh, and they're able to pretty much go all over the moon uh, as, and, and have a, a safe environment for themselves, given the radiation and other risks that there are uh, being on the surface. So once we go beyond the pressure vessel type, uh, inflatable structures have become more and more of interest uh, for a couple of good reasons. One is uh, we can build them on Earth, uh, put them into a small container, uh, send them to the lunar surface, and then inflate them there uh, and give, give our inhabitants large volumes to work from. Uh, the one negative of these pressure vessels is that they're very small, they're basically linear for most part, and they really don't create a, a good psychological environment for long term. Uh, in this image, we see a, a cutout just to see uh, what the interior might look like. Um, you can't see it here very clearly, but those, uh, the inflatable part uh, has uh, rings of regolith in, in, in large bags, basically, for shielding. Uh, and half this structure is beneath ground. And if you look at, toward the bottom, you see that where people are, are going to sleep uh, is underground for additional shielding. And then uh, the next level has a greenhouse. And above that, uh, a laboratory. And at the top level, uh, you see uh, a strange track where uh, you have somebody running around the track uh, on, a, on a very steep slope. Uh, and the reason for that, obviously, is that uh, in 1.6G, it's very hard to run in a circle without flying off. Uh, the end, so you have to be at an angle that balances your forces. And this is a little bit more advanced concept. This is by Carter Emmerich, who uh, is a space artist and uh, does a lot of other visualization things. Uh, here we have two inflatable structures. In the back, you see a couple of uh, greenhouses. Um, and I assume that this double, double habitat is for uh, safety in case something happens with one, uh, you go to the other. Obviously, a design of any inflatable habitat will require, uh, uh, as part of that design, uh, some safeguards as far as uh, if there's pressure leaks or if there's something catastrophic that happens uh, and the, the membrane collapses. So looking at the, uh, the greenhouse from the inside, you can see that uh, um, the hope, and we all uh, assume that uh, Agriculture will be a big part of any lunar habitat, and we'll need to do that uh, in order to survive. Um, it also provides psychological comfort. It provides uh, oxygen exchange, a lot of good reasons to have plants uh, with us on the, on the moon or Mars eventually. We have here one concept of uh, solar panels. Solar panels uh, being laid out in a smoothed out crater, um, forming a, a large concentrator. Uh, clearly, uh, solar solar uh, power would be a big part of our energy uh, um, source on the moon. Uh, unfortunately, it's only two weeks at a time, so we need uh, advanced battery technologies to keep us uh, powered during the night. Uh, and uh, nuclear power will also be a part of our energy balance uh, on the moon, Mars, and certainly beyond. Uh, a few concepts that, that we've been working on over the years. This is basically an igloo-shaped concept, um, and we did some analysis and design. And uh, you know, if you look look up my name, you'll find some of these paper, papers published. And certainly, if you contact me, I'll be glad to send uh, copies to you. Uh, in this concept, you see the regular shielding on top uh, with access and, and egress. We did some thermal analysis. This is a daylight uh, thermal analysis, so you can see the yellow is where the sun hits it. Um, where the blue is and the green is a, a shadow area. We see very large differences in temperature uh, and very high temperatures when uh, we're in the sun. So we have on the same structure, we have temperatures of uh, differences of, a, of 100 degrees and, and sometimes more. And at nighttime, of course, it's completely uh, 
everything is cold uh, with temperatures at minus 244 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So clearly uh, we have to deal with a thermal issue. In fact, uh, one of the issues is the creation of thermal heat thermal energy within the structure from the people and the electronic equipment. And the fact that we are in a hard vacuum means that we have to work harder to try to dissipate that heat outside of the structure. A more recent structure that we looked at is this hybrid structure. Again, uh, like the inflatable structure, we'd like to take advantage of uh, uh, being able to compress the structure into a small volume so we can launch it from Earth and then bring it to the lunar surface. So on the left side, you see the compact mode, the right side, you see the expanded mode. Uh, here's a, a, a drawing, uh, an, uh, just an animation showing how the structure will open up and deploy. And here it is uh, where the arms have been fully deployed. And you can see this concept uh, has a diameter of about 17 meters and a height of about nine meters. So it's quite a good volume. Uh, I believe it fits into uh, Elon Musk's largest rocket and that's how, that's how we sized it. And here's how, how it looks after a, uh, a membrane deploys. Uh, let me just show you a bit. Oops. The central column is where we have a membrane um, in compressed mode. And once this opens up to this point, then it deploys you, uh, using uh, uh, gas pressure to this, to this location here. And the idea is this will be all autonomous, allowing uh, the astronauts to just uh, come and then come and start fixing it up for usage. That, and ideally we would like to have autonomous uh, regular placement on top. Uh, more recent ideas are to use uh, uh, in situ resources along with layered manufacturing, 3D printing. Uh, a good amount of work has been done on that, but it does depend on the ability of processing local resources and having enough power to do everything that you need to do. Uh, there's also the issue of the robotics. It's all automated because uh, astronauts cannot become construction workers. And then you have the issues that I mentioned earlier about uh, the, um, these robots and, and these, these vehicles on the surface being um, subject to the regolith. Um, so maintenance, reliability, a lot of these uh, issues, um, survivability, uh, come into play as well. It's a little bit more, more recent uh, concept. Uh, it looks very, Everything looks very clean on these robots, but I guarantee you within a few hours, they'll be covered with regolith, and then there's the issue of maintaining all the, all the joints, all the mechanisms, uh, and making sure that they can still operate. And of course, power, you know, having power for that is important. Um, and even more recently, although people have talked about this for a while, is the use of uh, lava tubes. This is an earth lava tube, uh, but we know for a fact that they exist on the moon as well. Uh, we think that, um, that uh, Dave Scott, was when he approached Hadley Rill on, uh, in 1971, was approaching an, an opening to a lava tube. We have images of lava tubes. So this is a Marius Hill coal lava tube. These, these images are from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this is, uh, these are among the first images that provide evidence of subsurface voids on the lunar surface and beneath. So you can see the scale. The opening is on the order of 50 meters. Here's another uh, really great photograph. Uh, this is Mara Tranquilatis. Um, it has a, a depth of about 100 meters, a width also on that scale. So it's a huge opening. And uh, some of these have tunnels emanating out from the bottom. And so one thing that we looked at is, can they be used as eventual uh, locations? The advantage of course in being underground is that you don't have uh, almost any of the um, environmental issues that you have on the surface. You don't worry about micrometeorites, you don't worry about thermal effects, temperatures rel relatively benign. Um, obviously the gravity is still low gravity, um, but if you can imagine that you have this long tunnel underground and you can close off the ends and pressurize it, then within that contained volume, you're able to build um, regular structures. They don't have to be pressurized. They don't have to have anything special about them. Um, the challenge there is uh, we want to make sure that this, these lava tubes are uh, structurally stable. Uh, some of them are not. So we did a study uh, of, of one here, uh, an actual small lava tube with a width of about 120 meters. And what we did was we varied the, the, the roof thickness. And that's the critical uh, thing about lava tubes. 
if the if the roof is too thin, it can collapse. If it's very thick, then of course it's harder to get to. So that's an issue. And we did two, I'm just showing you two cases here. And we can see on the left a very thin roof uh, and just the calculation of what the stresses are going to be and where potential failures are going to be. So I can well, we can envision that at some point when we have some infrastructure on the moon, we're able to identify lava tubes and be able to um, test them, uh, make them structurally very strong, and then access them and, uh, and expand a lot of uh, our uh, operations beneath the surface. So just to conclude, uh, we talked a little bit about the lunar environment. Uh, a lot of issues there, I would say uh, many of them uh, are doable uh, for us engineering-wise. The low gravity and the other effects on the human body, uh, so we don't have answers to all of them, but we will probably develop those in part once we're on the moon. The right elect is something we have to address even before going to the moon because it will affect us and our machines on the lunar surface. And then I just uh, highlighted a few structures for you, um, just uh, identifying sort of a sequence of the kinds of structures people have looked at uh, and have designed. And uh, if I had to bet, uh, I would say that our first generation of structures on the moon are going to be these uh, rigid pressure vessels, maybe uh, with some inflatable parts to them, but that's a little bit more challenging. So thank you very much. Um, what, let me unshare. Oops. And if there are any questions, I'm certainly glad to, to address those. Oh, great presentation, lots of information. Appreciate it. Yes, well, do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, James asks if you can mention your book, Building Habitats on the Moon. Sure, so, uh, uh, so I wrote two books. One was Turning Dust to Gold, which was a future history. It was written. Uh, it was written from the, the so-called future in twenty one sixty nine. Uh, I was sort of envisioning, without being too too much fantasy, basically building on technologies that we are we know. How how our exploration, in particular of the moon, but also Mars, uh, would evolve. And then um, that was from two thousand ten and two thousand. I think it was eighteen. I had the, the building habitats on the moon. A little bit more technical. Uh, just um, uh, putting together uh, a lot of discussion on um, very, various uh, engineering aspects of building habitats on the moon, the environment uh, in, a, in a lot of detail, human physiology and psychology in some detail, uh, with some uh, details on various designs. So that's that's the last work on that. Um, and some speculation, but it's mostly what we know today and, and what how we would build habitats today. Cool. Uh, any other questions? There were a couple of comments as well. Uh, Marufa says, beautiful sketches. Thanks for sharing. And uh, uh, Matt Shaw, love those lava tube images. Definite June vibes. And Stanley Max uh, would uh, prefer if you use just metric units. I guess um, I, I'll vote for that too, but um, not not, I, not insisting. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's, if anybody that's, wants that's, to contact me, I'm glad to um, glad to respond to you. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.